offer our participants a unique insight into layering technique as well as umbrella guided bone regeneration and implant dentistry, especially in the aesthetic zone. We will also talk about techniques for horizontal and vertical augmentation and how to manage passive soft tissue closure in order to achieve predictable bone regeneration and implant dentistry. I want to provide to my patients uh, the best treatments and that includes advanced uh, bone regeneration and I think that uh, this course provides you so much knowledge about all the aspects of bone regeneration. I would recommend it and I feel really confident now that I would provide the best treatment for my implantation. I chose to sign up to Hassan's course to um, advance my skill set basically to advance bone augmentation and sort of revisiting the basic and fundamental principles of GBR. Uh, so it's been a fantastic course and yeah, I'll highly, highly recommend it, especially because it's so much evidence-based. What I've liked about this course is the mix of uh, the sort of lecture and the practical aspects of things and the chance to uh, place some um, graphs and do some, some practical hands-on techniques. Um, this will allow me to take it back into practice um, from Monday. The most I like about hands-on part of this course is that you have a real feel how, the, how you manage with the materials and you can apply on your daily clinical work. I learned more today is just uh, the evidence-based uh, studies about bone grafting, bone plug, and how to manipulate more the soft tissue around the implant to improve the longevity of the implants and the restoration. Well, uh, I came here to meet uh, Hassan. Uh, I know he's very passionate about the implants. He goes uh, all over the world to find the best knowledge and to pass it to us. I like to come here and learn more about uh, implants and uh, how to manage uh, complex cases. I'm a previous bed graduate. I did the one year long implant course with Hassan and I realized that there was a gap in my knowledge to do with bone grafting and when Hassan told me there was a course, I, I, I had to be here. I wanted to know about GBR, uh, complex bone grafting, vertical horizontal augmentation and I've had all those learning outcomes fulfilled because we've had theory, we've had experts, we've had case presentations and we've had a practical aspect of the course. Come and join us at this advanced master class when we're going to have excitement and fun, but it's going to be all based on evidence-based knowledge and proper understanding of biology and implant dentistry. I look forward to welcoming you to our master class. Masterclass in Advanced Guided Bone Regeneration in Implant Dentistry will offer our participants a unique insight into layering technique as well as umbrella guided bone regeneration in implant dentistry, especially in the aesthetic zone. We will also talk about techniques for horizontal and vertical augmentation and how to manage passive soft tissue closure in order to achieve predictable bone regeneration in implant dentistry. I want to provide to my patients uh, the best treatments and that includes advanced uh, bone regeneration and I think that uh, this course provides you so much knowledge about all the aspects of bone regeneration. I would recommend it and I feel really confident now that I would provide the best treatment for my implantation. I chose to sign up to Hassan's course to um, advance my skill set basically to advance bone augmentation and sort of revisiting the basic and fundamental principles of GBR. Uh, so it's been a fantastic course and yeah, I'll highly, highly recommend it, especially because it's so much evidence-based. What I've liked about this course is the mix of uh, the sort of lecture and the practical aspects of things and the chance to uh, place some um, graphs and do some, some practical hands-on techniques. Um, this will allow me to take it back into practice um, from Monday. 
the most I like about hands-on part of this course is that you have a real feel how the how you manage with the materials and you can apply on your daily clinical work. I learned more today is just uh, the if there's based uh, studies about bone grafting, bone plug, and how to manipulate more the soft tissue around the implants to improve the longevity of the implants and the restoration. Well, uh, I came here to meet uh, Hassan. Uh, I know he's very passionate about the implants. He goes uh, all over the world to find the best knowledge and to pass it to us. I like to come here and learn more about uh, implants and uh, how to manage uh, complex cases. I'm a previous Baird graduate. I did the one year long implant course with Hassan and I realized that there was a gap in my knowledge to do with bone grafting and when Hassan told me there was a course, I, I, I had to be here. I wanted to know about GBR, uh, complex bone grafting, vertical horizontal augmentation and I've had all those learning outcomes fulfilled because we've had theory, we've had experts, we've had case presentations and we've had a practical aspect of the course. Come and join us at this advanced master class when we're going to have excitement and fun but it's going to be all based on evidence-based knowledge and proper understanding of biology in implant dentistry. I look forward to welcoming you to our master class. Masterclass in Advanced Guided Bone Regeneration in Implant Dentistry will offer our participants a unique insight into layering technique as well as umbrella guided bone regeneration in implant dentistry, especially in the aesthetic zone. We will also talk about techniques for horizontal and vertical augmentation and how to manage passive soft tissue closure in order to achieve predictable bone regeneration in implant dentistry. I want to provide to my patients uh, the best treatments and that includes advanced uh, bone regeneration and I think that uh, this course provides you so much knowledge about all the aspects of bone regeneration. I would recommend it and I feel really confident now that I would provide the best treatment for my implant patients. I chose to sign up to Hassan's course to um, advance my skill set basically in advanced bone augmentation and sort of revisiting the basic and fundamental principles of GBR. Uh, so far it's been a fantastic course and yeah, I highly, highly recommend it, especially because it's so much evidence based. What I've liked about this course is the mix of uh, the sort of lecture and the practical aspects of things and the chance to uh, place some um, graphs and do some, some practical hands-on techniques. Um, this will allow me to take it back into practice um, from Monday. The most I like about hands-on part of this course is that you have a real feel how, the, how you manage with the materials and you can apply on your daily clinical work. I learned more today is just uh, the, if there's based uh, studies about bone grafting, bone plug, and how to manipulate more the soft tissue around the implants. To... So, um, good evening everyone. Um, greetings from uh, Leeds. Um, it's so nice to be here today with you at this uh, Guided Bone Regeneration and Implant Dentistry webinar. Uh, kindly organized by my good friend uh, Mazen Dumani uh, from Dentistry Online uh, Group. And it's great to be here with you today at this hard time. Obviously, um, sending all my best wishes to all my friends all around the globe to stay safe, keep well, and hopefully we can together fight this coronavirus. Now, um, today I'm going to share with you um, a clinical presentation, Guided Bone Regeneration and Implant uh, Dentistry. And the idea is to just share with you some of my clinical tips and hints, my experience, what I've been doing in my dental uh, practice, and uh, take it from there. Um, obviously, um, 
um, my name is Hassan Megera. I'm a clinician. I uh, see my patients um, mainly in, in an implant uh, dental practice. So all my services are to do with dental implants, but I'm also involved in academia. I'm lucky to be um, teaching at the University of Manchester and the College of the Medicine and Dentistry, um, Ulster University in Birmingham. And I'm also lucky to be the head of the scientific committee of uh, the British Academy of Implant and Restorative Dentistry based in Leeds and uh, sending you all my greetings uh, from the United Kingdom. I'm so happy to see a lot of my friends joining us from UK, um, my Baird family, my friends. Uh, so greetings to my Baird family in United Kingdom. And I'm also delighted to see my friends joining from all around the globe. Uh, this is amazing. And uh, once again, thank you so much, my friend Mazen, for organizing this webinar. Now, whenever we talk about implant dentistry, as an implant dentist, we have a duty to understand biology. And I would like to start, share, start by sharing this very short video, less than two minutes, about how things work when you have a fracture, um, like a bone fracture. But I think the same principles apply whenever you drill an osteotomy and hoping for implant uh, to heal in that osteotomy, and also when you do guided bone regeneration and hoping for best results. So let's let's have a look at this video, uh, uh, courtesy of Amgen, and uh, it will show step by step how things work when things heal. Obviously, you're going to start by having a hematoma, and that hematoma uh, will bring all the good things into the area. And then ideally, in a healthy person, we're going to have some angiogenesis. Now, we're going to have some undifferentiated mesenchymal cells being released. And if they receive a good signal, they're going to stimulate osteoclast and osteoplast afterwards to start to form, you know, the cascade of bone formation. And what I mean by receiving good signal, because if we have unhealthy patient, that signal to the mesenchymal, uh, undifferentiated mesenchymal cells, going to be not a good signal and they're going to form fibroplasts instead of osteoplast. Or if you have a bit of mobility in the implant or even in the graft, we're going to have wrong signals. So these cells are going to form something wrong. So it's all about getting the right signal. And this is what we're going to talk about today in the next 45 minutes. So, once things heal, it will all follow what Wolf's Law states, form follows function. And if we try to explain this, what does that mean when it comes to clinical perspective? When it comes to clinical perspective, we need to understand that cells are going to perform in the best way we need them to do, to provide a specific function, providing we provide them the right signals, we providing we use them in the right way. And this is the whole concept of bone regeneration based on this, form follows function. So for today, obviously, bone guide, guided bone regeneration is such a big topic and it's something we cover in our master class um, about over a day or two at the part of the Baird Academy. But however, we're going to try to answer three questions in the next 45 minutes. There are so many different types of bone there in the market. And the question is, what bone shall we use to manage such an implant defect 
and when to use what. The second point we're going to do is if we're going to use particles, are they going to work all the time? Or shall we some or are we sometimes limited with what we use and we have to go for blocks? So the question is particles versus blocks. And then the third question, which I'm going to try to share with you today, some techniques which I would like to share with you to hopefully reach perfection or at least um, predictable results in guided boundary generation. This is the worst time ever we can, you know, go ahead with GBR and then three months down the line, all that bone will disappear. So basically, we need to know what to use when, whether it's alloplast, allograft, xenograft. When are we going to be all right going for simultaneous GBR at the time of implant placement or obviously limited with uh, bone grafting or maybe um, if we're going to do GPR what are the techniques I recommend to give you a more predictable GPR now let's understand that any treatment plan you and I are gonna formulate for that specific patient is gonna be different from one person to another and this is what we teach as part of the Baird Academy that one size doesn't fit all you cannot have one flap design for all your cases. You cannot have one implant design for all your cases. You cannot have one bone material for all your cases. And also, you cannot expect the same treatment working, giving you the same results with two different patients. So we should be aware of the various treatment options. And then only then, taking in consideration all the surrounding circumstances, we can choose the best therapy. However, we all agree that, you know, if we give a case to 100 dentists, we should all receive or we reach the same diagnosis. So we cannot disagree on a diagnosis, but we all understand that there will be different treatment plans suggested by different dentists to achieve the chosen outcome. As long as we agree, what is that chosen outcome? From my point of view, when it comes to implant dentistry, you know, we all understand that integration is something important. Implant integration, osseo integration is something important, but this is not the challenge we have anymore. The challenge in 2020 is maintaining osseo integration, maintaining bone and soft tissue stability around the implants in an aesthetic way. You might decide you don't want to be an aesthetic implant dentist. It's up to you. But I think the way things are going, our patients are very well educated and they understand that they want to receive something which looks as natural as possible. You know, when it comes to implant dentistry, it's all about the final product rather than the implant itself. It's all about the final soft tissue contour. And we understand these things don't happen by coincidence. We have a duty, all of us, to be the best we can be. And when it comes to implant dentistry, like it or not, at the moment, it's all about the pink challenge. Obviously, we want it to be healthy, and we want it to look natural. And when we come to talk about pink aesthetics, there are so many different features. It starts with that labial convexity. One of the main things which can tell whether this is a false tooth or something looks natural, whether this is implant successful or not, is do we have that labial convexity matching the adjacent teeth in a harmonious way? And then we're going to need to work on the zenith because it's all about symmetry. Papilla is important because obviously these black triangles usually in the aesthetic zone are not very satisfactory. And then we need to work on the soft tissue level. And then obviously emergence profile. You cannot have one circular emergence profile for all your cases. An emergence profile of a central incisor looks different than an emergence profile of a premolar or of a canine or even a molar. 
And then if we can get the color right and the texture, that all together will give you that pink aesthetics. Now let's agree, soft tissue is the issue. However, we all understand now that you cannot get satisfactory soft tissue without bone underneath. And we understand that mainly when you take teeth out, you're gonna have bone defects in most of the cases because we have a very thin labial plate. And that labial plate, according to the bundle bone theory, is gonna resolve the moment you take a tooth out. We also understand that if you place implants within the prosthetic envelope aiming for screw retained restorations, most likely you're gonna get fenestrations or defects. And these defects need to be managed. So in order to get a good quality soft tissue, and in order to get nice looking soft tissue, we need to work on the bone. And we're gonna to talk to you later today how we build bone in layers. But only when the bone is built in a proper way, you can hope to get satisfactory soft tissue like that. So it is a process which starts by placing the implant in the correct position, building the bone, and then aiming for better surgical and prosthetic soft tissue management. Then later on, you can work on your prosthetic work to get a satisfactory results. So let's go back to these three questions. We need to build bone. Shall we use xenograft, allograft, or alloplast? Obviously, as you might remember from our basic implant dentistry, alloplast, the bone which comes from the lab, allograft from the human tissue bank, and xenograft from animals, different species. And then the second question, are we gonna use particles, simultaneous GBR, or are we gonna do staged approach, for example, blocks? So, let me start with, I'm gonna go with you through three rules. There are so many rules when it comes to GBR, but I'd like to share with you in this short webinar three rules. We need to understand aesthetic implant dentistry, it's literally like dominoes. Every layer depends on the layer afterwards, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, in implant dentistry, we need to start with looking at the palatal bone. So many times we take CBCTs and we start looking at sagittal, and we start to look at that labial plate, which is important. But I would recommend also looking at the axial view and look at that palatal bone. Because if that palatal bone is too thick, it might drift your implant to labial. If that palatal bone has a defect, you might need to put the implant in the right position and build that palatal bone rather than place the implant again to labial. Obviously, labial plate is important because as you will see later on to get a proper GBR, you, need, you will get better results if the defect is contained, what we call three-wall defect. So this is what we're talking about. So we're gonna get a palatal bone. We're gonna check that, make sure there is no defect. And if there is defect, it will change our treatment plan. We're gonna talk about the labial plate and we already understand the importance of the labial plate to contain the GBR, to provide the support and to provide obviously the source for the blood vessels and all the good cells. And then, you need to choose the correct size of your implant. In the past, we used to think, go for wide implants to give us mechanical stability. And this is right, the widest the implant, the more mechanical stability you're gonna get on the long term. However, we do understand now that if we go for a wider implant, we're gonna invade the space, which should be filled with bone for protection. So nowadays, we go, and our recommendation is to go for the narrowest implant mechanics allow you, or go for the widest implant biology allows you. So it has to be a multifactorial decision. We never go for very wide implant in the anterior region, full stop, period. Now, that gap, ideally, we want to have a labial gap. In ideal scenario, that labial gap needs to be bigger than the palatal gap. 
If it's other way around, you know your implant is placed too labial, and you're going to end with an implant compromising the labial plate, giving you recession within a year or two. So we always like to maintain that labial gap. Now, in the past, I used to remember um, they were teaching us if the gap is less than two millimeter, leave it alone. You, there is no need to, uh, to graft that gap. Well, nowadays, I can tell you the recommendations we pass to our uh, colleagues uh, the Baird Academy, that if this gap is fillable, it needs to be filled. Because you might use that labial plate, most likely you're going to lose it. You want to have something to protect your implant. So you put some bone under, in that gap. And we're going to talk later about what's the ideal type of bone to fill that gap. And then we need to achieve that convexity we were talking about. You could decide to go for some type of bone augmentation to ridge contour that area, or you might decide to use soft tissue graft to contour that area. It's up to you to decide what you want to do. But what I don't like you, or what I don't want you, is to just ignore it and do nothing. And that's why I never go for flapless implants in the aesthetic region without any further bone or soft tissue uh, management for that convexity. You could go flapless and could do tunnel technique and put connective tissue graft if this is what you want to do, fair enough. But you cannot just put the implant, fill the gap and hope for the best because in no time, and we've seen it within two years, you're going to lose that labia plate and you're going to have that concavity which is going to be like a shout out, this is a false tooth. And then obviously, if you're going to do some ridge contouring and ridge augmentation, we will talk to you about the importance of stabilizing that membrane. Because we know now, if the membrane isn't well stabilized, that guided bone regeneration, that ridge contouring, contouring is not going to be as predictable, as reliable as you would like it to be. So basically, this is what we want to do. Start by looking at the palatal bone. Place the implant as palatal as possible within the socket in an angle to allow the head of the implant to come out in the cingulum region rather than in the incisal edge or in the labial wall. Fill the gap with some bone for protection and then do some ridge contouring. I personally like to do with bone. Other people could do a connective tissue or both. So it's up to you to decide. But that's what we want to do. So, the second rule I would like to share with you, my friends. When it comes to guided bone regeneration, it has to be biology-driven rather than market-driven. What, what do I mean by biology-driven? You need to understand the biology of every type of bone, available, bone material available in the market. You cannot just aim to use one magic powder to solve all your problems. It just doesn't work. So in the market, there are alloplast, allograft, xenograft. And what I've done today, the alloplast, which are basically made in the lab, they are complete, they're big variation of alloplasts in the market. Mainly they go into two families, monophasic alloplast, which has basically self-setting calcium sulfate, and there is biphasic alloplasts, which are basically hydroxyapatite and calcium phosphate. Now, the good thing about alloplasts is that they tend to remodel very quickly. So, within 12 weeks, you're going to get sort of what looks like a true bone. However, studies have shown and you know, clinical experience has shown that with monophasic, you get early resorption. Now, even hydroxyapatite, which delays that resorption, you still get resorption. So for me personally, when we talk about that ridge contouring to get this nice convexity, I will never use alloplast to do that. Alloplast is perfect for ridge preservation, like a short-term ridge preservation. That's fantastic. Alloplast, 
are perfect to cover these little exposed threads if you don't have autogenous bond. That's perfect. But cannot be used by themselves to achieve aesthetic results. Now, if you're happy to use them to save yourself some money, because alloplasts, some of them, they set hard, they, you don't need a membrane, fair enough. But don't sort of start to expect aesthetic results. Now, allograft, they're a bit different. Allograft, they come from the human tissue bank. They have a rem quick remodeling, not as quick as alloplast, and they do resorb, but not as much as alloplast. So it's like somewhere in the middle. For me personally, allograft is the nearest to autogenous bond. Now, xenograft, we all know now that they give you very, very, very slow remodeling, but also very, very, very slow resorption. So for me, ridge contouring is definitely going to be made and maintained by this xenograft. However, I would not like to do ridge preservation with xenograft and come back after three or four months to place an implant. Because I know in three, four, five months down the line, that socket will not, or that ridge will not be made by true bond. As you will see later on, we started to lose trust in 100% xenograft. I remember 10 years ago, we used to go for sinus grafting using 100% xenograft. Nowadays, we don't like that. So xenografts are good, but we're not, we don't like them 100% anymore because we started to find usually five, seven years onwards, some of these xenografts, they're still xenograft, and they, they, the moment they get exposed to a bit of bacteria, the infection spreads like a nuclear bomb there. So that's something you need to know. So for me, the guidelines, and that's in line with the ITI guidelines, we don't like xenograft touching the exposed threads of your implants because that xenograft will remodel very, very, very slowly into natural bond. Ideally, you would like to have some autogenous bond covering your um, exposed threads, because obviously autogenous bond is the one which will, can, will act as osseoinductive, osseoconductive, and osteogenic if it's harvested in a right way. And then second layer for ridge contouring is going to be our xenograft, and then membrane is going to be essential. And we understand that membrane is essential because, number one, it will contain that defect. It will stop fibroplasts coming into the area and it will shape it for you. It will give you that nice convexity, especially if you stabilize it in a good way. So, are we, are we still all right? I see some people saying there's no sound. Te can you put a note? Tell me if it's all right or not. Okay. So, we're going to keep going, I think. So that's the first rule. The second rule, autogenous needs to be on exposed threads, and you could harvest autogenous in different ways. The easiest way is basically to, whenever you're going for your twist drills, to go very slow speed, maybe 70, 80 RPM, with very little water, uh, very no irrigation. So you can harvest some good, auto, uh, some sort of autogenous bone on the drills. If that autogenous bond is red in color, you know that you did not overheat the drills. So that bond can be used. However, some comparative studies showing that actually you don't get really good quality autogenous bond. There'll be very little um, osteogenic cells in that bond. And they prefer to go for something like bond scrapers, safe bond scrapers, or even better with piezo surgery to harvest autogenous bond.
The third rule, in cases with large defects, where you really need huge amount of autogenous bond to cover the exposed threads, and you don't want to put your patient through second surgery, you don't want to go like open a second site, you could use something which will replace autogenous and will remodel to autogenous in a very short time, which could be alloplast or your allograft. And in my hands, I prefer the allograft. So I would go for um, dry freezed allograft and put that covering the exposed threads. And this will be my first layer. And after that, I'm going to go and put my xenograft on the top. So, these are the three rules. Number one, autogenous covering the exposed threads. That's my plan A. Like in this case, you could see place an implant in the anterior region um, following the prosthetic envelope. You're going to have some exposed threads. Autogenous covering this if you can. And then on the top of that, you put your xenograft to give you your convexity. However, in the, like the lower case, you could see we've got a huge defect. And rather than trying to put the patient through big trauma, you could just put some allograft, you could off the shelf, and that allograft can be later on covered with xenograft. Now, the, the third question we have, what bone graft we're going to use? Are we gonna go for particles or blocks? Basically, we need to understand that guided bone regeneration follows the rules of guided tissue regeneration. And whenever we have a defect, we need to look at the defect and see how many remaining walls are there. This is a common mistake people do. When they go to the classification, they think how many walls they've lost and they name it according to that. Actually, it should be according to how many walls remaining. So, an implant in a socket with an intact labial plate, we would call it a three-wall defect because we have three walls remaining, mesial, distal, and labial. While an implant in a socket with a lost labial plate or a defect in labial plate, that would be two-wall defect, that we have two walls remaining, mesial and distal. And from there, we can say three-wall defect and two wall defects are considered favorable defects. And hence, these are suitable cases for guided bone regeneration. And that goes from Danny Boozer saying that you need to have favorable defect to be able to produce a predictable guided bone regeneration. However, if you have unfavorable defect, like a defect when there is only one mesial wall, for example, no labial, no distal. So if we have one wall remaining or where defects, literally nothing left, no mesial, no distal, no labial. We call it no wall defects. And these are not going to be suitable for um, simultaneous guided bone regeneration. Or even if you have a defect with two walls, but the distance is too far from each other. Hence, the guided bone regeneration particles are not going to be stable and we're going to have problems with achieving good quality angiogenesis into the whole type of, the whole quantity of the bone. Hence, guided bone regeneration cannot be done as a simultaneous approach and you will need to consider staged approach in these cases. So when we talk about staged bone grafting, as I said earlier on, there are different ways. There are different ways to achieve um, any sort of chosen outcome. You could go for um, membranes, non-resorbable membranes and particles. You could go for titanium mesh and particles, or you could go for blocks. When it comes to blocks, you could go for autogenous blocks, as I used to do seven years ago. But the morbidity and mortality and the discomfort associated with that was really, really high. And seven years ago, I switched to allograft blocks. Allograft blocks, basically, they come off the shelf. And the beauty of the allograft blocks I use nowadays, that they come from 
human tissue banks where we have live donors, where they do proper um, screening for the donor, good blood testing, and we know that these are safe donors. Now, the blocks can be all cancerless or cancerless covered with a small cortical plate. We call it unicortical cancerless blocks. This is a different topic to a different lecture, but I have a lecture on um, a webinar actually on BOTIS Academy where you could access that for free and you could look at that lecture talking about different types of blocks, mechanics and biology. But let me share with you this case. Carrie is a very nice young lady who lost her front tooth long time ago. And she lived for about 10 years with this sort of Maryland, which didn't look great for her. But she made finally the decision to do something about it. And she came wanting to have implants. Her upper six implant was treated as part of the Bird Academy courses we do in Leeds, where we do life surgeries by our uh, course participants. Another front, um, we treated her at our practice in Leeds, me and my team. So we, from the very beginning, we decided we we're going to need to um, put a veneer or something on the other right central incisor and to, to get proper space analysis and then also place an implant in the upper left central incisor. But when you look at the CBCT, you could see that we have limited bone volume down to 3.4. So placing an implant in the correct position would be a challenge. We talked to the patient about different treatment options, and she decided to go for allograft block. Whenever we want to do surgeries, we would like to do um, ridge uh, mapping, bone sounding, to check which flap design we're going to need to use. And in this case, it was favorable. Um, there is bone sounding less than three millimeter away from the papillae. So we raise a three-sided um, uh, three flap with the golf club incisions. And we raise them gently. And you could see the defect. It's what we call in this case one wall defect. We had mesial wall but no distal wall. And then from there, we put the block in place. We shave the block. We try nowadays to minimize the thickness of the cortical plate of the block to less than one millimeter, ideally, if we can. Whenever we do these blocks, we try to put either two screws to stop rotation, but we make the screws in oblique way, because if you put them above each other, there might be a chance to initiate some cracks in the middle. And um, obviously, mucoperiosis release may achieve what we call 110% closure to make sure you close the flap passively with no tension. We do sling sutures to achieve good adaptation even on the adjacent teeth. And then we leave it to heal for about 24 weeks. 24 weeks, patient comes back. We take a scan and you can see now we've got nearly 7 millimeter. So we managed to achieve good bone integration as well. And from there, we proceeded with placing an implant in the correct position within the prosthetic envelope. An implant with the shoulder of the implant coming out in the cingulum region. And then we did some guided bone regeneration just to get a, a nice contour. We left the implant to heal for 12 weeks, after which we did exposure. We fit a temporary crown for a few weeks. We build a, the temporary veneer on the other side to get proper space analysis. And we customize our impression pickups. We've got our restoration back. These restorations were made by my friend Guglielmo in Napoli, it, south of Italy. He's a really good ceramist. And from there, we've got a screw retained crown on the implant and a ceramic veneer on the other central incisor. And what's more important, we managed to achieve symmetry. Now, from my side, that, you know, when you look at this view, um, you could see we've got symmetry even in the convexity of both sides. Now, yes, allograft blocks make it much easier for general practitioners to achieve bond blocker grafting. But you need to understand there is a challenge that you need to 
shave the block to fit in the right way. You need to achieve good adaptation and good precise adaptation between the block and the recipient bed. And that will take time, which means more time with the flap being raised, more um, high risk of things going wrong and infection. That's why nowadays we move to the CAD CAM bond blocks. And the idea of the CAD CAM bond block that you literally send the scan to the human tissue bank and they will design the perfect model to fit perfectly at the defect in the recipient site. So in this case, you could see the 3D uh, planning you do uh, with the um, human tissue bank, and this is from BOTUS. And you could say, right, if we place two implants, it's obvious we have a very thin ridge. And you say, right, to place two implants in the perfect position following the prosthetic envelope, how much bond we need to do. So you design the block and you send this uh, planning um, to the human tissue bank and they will send you back after three to four weeks a block, cancellous block, which literally fits in within three seconds into the defect area. So a procedure which used to take about 45 minutes to shave and cl clean the block now and fit the block takes about three minutes. And you can see in this case, we managed to achieve vertical as well as horizontal augmentation. In this case, we use a vestibular flap. So keeping the crystal area under very little tension. And just to show you, we left it to heal for about 20 weeks. And you could see we went from literally around two millimeter to 7.5 millimeter. So, so far, we summarize, in order to do guided bone regeneration successfully in the anterior region, you will need to understand the biology of the different particles in the market. You need to understand the classification of the um, defect. Is it three wall, two wall, or one wall, or no wall defect? And finally, you need to understand that the implant position is mandatory to be 100% perfect for the GBR to work. Because if the implant is placed in the wrong position, a bit too labial, invading the space which ideally should have been there for the bone. So all the bone you're gonna put on the top of that implant gonna go for a waste. Let's look at a few clinical cases to sort of put this into clinical perspective. This is Jonathan. Jonathan came to see me with both of his center and lateral extracted by his referring dentist a few weeks before coming to see me. We placed two implants in the prosthetic envelope. And as you could see, I don't use cover screws. We always use healing abutments, even if you're gonna need to bury these implants because healing abutments can act like a, a post tenting the membrane and this is what i call the umbrella guided bone regeneration technique from there we cover the exposed threads with autogenous and then we build the convexity with xenograft we leave it for 12 weeks and then exposure temporization with good contact area to help the papilla to start to form nicely and then customizing our impression pickups. And from there, we finished the case for him. Now, five years down the line, he came back wanting that diastema between the two central incisors to be closed. So we closed the diastema with a composite filling done by my colleague, Dr. Victoria Ivansheva. And within a month or six weeks, you could see how the papilla start to creep down. So we do understand nowadays, and it is, you know, being well established that no contact point, no papilla. And that's the difference. But if you look at the convexity we have there, which use, it used to be a big defect, you could understand how following the layering technique give you predictable GBR on the long term. Another case, David came to see me. Again, two central incisors were perio involved. Uh, his dentist had to remove them a um, few weeks before coming to see me again, but perio is well controlled. Now, when we did bone sounding, it was obvious that both papillae were not favorable. 
So we decided to preserve the papilla for him. We placed the implant as palatal as possible within the socket, within the prosthetic envelope, aiming for screw-retained restorations, also aiming to maintain that labial space and maintain the interceptal bone between the two implants. First layer to cover exposed threads, it was such a big defect, so we had to use uh, aloe graft, grafted up to the level of the healing abutments. And then second layer to build the convexity was xenograft, and then we use collagen membrane. I prefer Jason membrane because it's stretchable and it's very easy to use and it doesn't resorb up to five months. So after that, we start to do the prosthetic stages, temporization, achieve the zenith, achieve the papilla. And when we reach a point when the patient is happy, we were happy, we took the final impression for the final restoration for him. Another case, Claire. Claire came to us with a missing central incisor. This tooth been missing for a long time, about four or five years. She had a denture, but now she had enough. She wanted to have a fixed restoration. She didn't want to have a bridge, so implant was the way forward. As you could see with Claire, she had thin biotype. So um, we that was one of the challenges. But also when we did the bone sounding, it was obvious that both papillae were not favorable. Now, another way to, to predict that, you, by literally looking at the periapical x-ray, and you could measure the distance, mesially and distally, and if you could see the adjacent teeth with some bone loss, you know that if you raise these papillae, you're going to lose them again. So in this case, we had to do ridge preservation. Sorry, we had to do papillary preserving flaps. Again, everything placed according to the prosthetic envelope. You identify where's your um, gingival, future gingival line. And we have what we call the T concept. You measure three millimeter away from the future gingival line. And you put a, a straight line where you want the zenith of the implant to be. And you place the implant in the correct position. Now, you could see here we have a concavity. Yes, implants are not exposed, but you cannot just leave this like this and hope to have an aesthetic case. So we had to do guided bone regeneration. In this case, I use mucoderm, which is a porcine dermis, to, which can act as a soft tissue graft, but also as a membrane. It's naturally cross-linked and it's packed really well, can act as a good isolation and we stabilize it. We always like to stabilize our membranes. So we stabilize one side, lift it backward, and do the um, cerebone, the xenograft. And before that, we do cortectomies to get some bone and some good osteogenic cells coming from the medullary spaces. And then we build the convexity. And from there, we stabilize the membrane by another pen, and we even suture the mucoderm palatally to make sure we've got a proper well-contained um, guided bone regeneration. And we buried the implant for 12 weeks, after which we did a simple exposure, built a chair side temporary crown using these um, CAD Vita abutments. And we built the temporary crowns according to the guidelines we know, subgingival concavity, supragingival convexity, get the contact area really well, and um, you decide how much space you want to allow the papilla to creep down. But let's remember that this papilla was preserved and I do not expect the papilla to grow further down because the bone is like literally four millimeter away. We know between a single implant and adjacent teeth, you can get away with 4.5, nothing more. So screw retained restoration, and that's our final restoration in place, done by Hughes Lab in Harrogate. But you could see the convexity, and that's what matters. We managed to rebuild the convexity to make the tooth look as natural as possible. And luckily, although she had a high smile line, she was happy with the final restoration. Now, what we do nowadays, I, tell, I told you, I mentioned that we've 
we don't trust 100% xenograft anymore, even as a second layer, even as a contouring layer. So we start to mix xenograft with autogenous or with um, allograft, because allograft can have this osseoinductive as well um, if it's treated really well. There are some reports showing that allograft can have, um, they can release bone morphogenic proteins. But also, they have the ability to remodel quickly into autogenous bone. So that xenograft, we know now you don't need 100% xenograft to maintain the convexity. You could mix it, and a bit of xenograft in that con rich contour will do the trick. But we would like that xenograft to have some live bone within it. Hence, either we mix it with autogenous or with allograft. We put a membrane on the top, and then we put a mucoderm in this case, we stabilize it really well, and we take it from there. This is another case where patient needed um, two implants to restore the missing two premolars. So we place 3.3 rock solid implants, and you could see the defect, a huge defect there. Rather than try to achieve um, auto, uh, autogenous um, graft from another site, we just put the membrane, um, lift it back, cortectomy to get this uh, good cells from the bone marrow space. Always use two millimeter healing abutments instead of cover screws, even in cases when you have very low um, stability and you want to bury your implants, two millimeter healing abutments will do the trick because they were gonna tent your membrane and you could put the first layer, in this case was allograft. Now the second layer, as you could see, it's around 60% allograft, 40% xenograft mix. Mix them together and build a nice rich contour. Please always remember you need to invest in um, stabilization pins because they will make your GBR much easier and more importantly, more predictable. So what I like about JSON membrane, as I mentioned before, it's stretchable and also you could suture through it. And it's one of the very few membranes of the market where you could suture through JSON membrane. So one pen, two pen, three pens, and then where number four and five, we put some stitches, uh, even four O, you don't need to go six O and anything like that. Uh, four O nylon, suture it palatally. And from there, you could see how we managed to build the, um, the labial convexity and we've managed to get good results. This is how we were and this is how we are at the moment and we patient was happy. The last case I want to share with you for a, a very nice gentleman. He was in his uh, late 70s but he plays saxophone and um, He's a very talented uh, gentleman. So he came with his failing upper central incisor. It was a failing post crown with a big crack. Tooth was extracted and we put a rochette. And as you could see, there was a huge amount of uh, vertical bone loss and recession. We like um, to leave it eight weeks early placement. And when we did the surgery, we lifted the flab. As you could imagine, with failing post crowns, you will always find a long V-shaped effect. The idea is to leave, to elevate the flap as palatal as possible and try to keep that gran granulation tissue, um, which inside the socket, keep it attached to the flap because that will increase the thickness of your flap. Implant place in the prosthetic envelope. You could see here, you know, when I placed that implant, there was a little palatal gap. And I knew it, I'm going to need to go for um, cement retained rather than screw retained. However, I'm still within the prosthetic envelope. So uh, membrane stabilization, we used uh, collagen JSON membrane. First layer was allograft. Second layer, uh, xenograft mixed with some allograft. And then well stabilized, nicely contoured. And, you know, when you close... We don't need to worry about tight closure anymore if you're using JSON membrane or a mucoderm. 
but you know something to keep the keratinized mucosa um, labially and then from there 12 weeks down the line when you use healing abutments most of the time they will self expose themselves but you could see the convexity is well maintained temporization for a few weeks and after that the cat cam cement uh, retained uh, abutment and you could see with the cementation make sure excess cement all removed that's our final restoration the most important thing is you could see the convexity well maintained on the lateral photo and 45 degrees photo so my friends the conclusion when it comes to implant dentistry it is a multidisciplinary approach you it's like a dominoes approach it starts by having the end result um, as you know your target you need to picture the end result before you start aim for a implants place in the prosthetic envelope build a bone surgical and prosthetic soft tissue management and only then you can get good results providing you're very obsessed and passionate about aesthetic implant dentistry now I would like to end this presentation with this case which I did with a very good friend very good friend of mine Dr. Ali Faris from Baghdad Iraq who is a Baird graduate and I was in Baghdad um, about two three years ago and we did this um, bone grafting uh, for this uh, very young chap who was a student at medical school he had car accident and lost his uh, teeth so we did uh, these allograft blocks left them for about 24 weeks and you could see how they well integrated and then Dr. Ali took the case from there placed the implants and um, went through soft tissue grafting with Dr. Um, Bashar in uh, uh, Baghdad Smile Center in uh, Iraq and then we ended with a good well through retained restoration um, we started from minus 10 and we ended with 10 out of 10 and you could see that's the final result now this case and many other cases uh, about um, allograft blocks will follow in uh, another webinar hopefully uh, in April and um, I look forward to meeting you there obviously all the work I do uh, cannot be complete without the great help and support I have at my team uh, I've got uh, Victoria who's an implant cosmetic dentist and uh, she's um, she helps me a lot as you know so thank you very much Victoria and I've got Laura my implant coordinator who looks after us um, in our practice in Leeds so thank you very much Victoria and Laura you could uh, follow them um, that's their Instagram and uh, Victoria underscore Ivanchev for Victoria and implants by Hassan for Laura but I would also like to thank my Baird family um, in Leeds and uh, United Kingdom and outside because because of their help and support uh, this is where we are um, now um, we celebrated our 10 year anniversary last uh, June and um, yeah thank you very much for being great family my Baird family um, I would also like to invite you to our um, eyelid stay at home congress it's going to be online congress 8th and 9th of april we're going to have 16 international speakers and uh, it's, we're going to do it on zoom so you need to register with us um, you could register by following this email admin at bear.uk.com it's going to be an amazing congress we're going to cover implants lasers aesthetic and digital dentistry 8th and 9th of april and uh, obviously, I'd like to extend my uh, gratitude to you. Um, thank you very much for giving me your time and for being here with me in this webinar. And um, stay positive, stay strong, stay happy. And um, I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, you could uh, post some questions and comments uh, on the Dentistry Online uh, page and I'll try to answer them um, if I'm there. 
Thank you so much. Okay, let me go through the page and see if I have any questions. Okay, so start from the very beginning. I have a question. Um, all right, it's really nice to see all our uh, friends from from all around the world. Hello. Hello, North Island. Hello, Leeds. Hello, Birmingham. Um, everyone, thank you. Hello, Saudi Arabia. Okay, Haroon, why would you need to go cemetery ten crown if the gap is palate? Uh, there is a gap 